Hey weirdos, just a heads up that as this is a Dark Ives episode from 2017, it does have some language that is more aggressive than I typically allow in the new episodes. Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. People keep on asking me what it is with me and water. I drink it, sure. Obviously, I have to in order to stay alive, but when I grab my bottle, it's when I'm severely and absolutely dehydrated, and not until I reach my threshold of thirst. I know this takes a toll on my body over time, but a part of me cannot yet overcome the sheer horror I faced a few months back from the apparently harmless water. I am still recovering from the shock of it all, and my shrink has taken it on the top of her priority list to help me overcome my fear. The very water that sustains life has taken the very essence of it out of me. You see, it's not the water itself that I'm terrified of. It's what is inside of it. I was a university researcher a few months back specializing in microbiology and currently on an indefinite leave from the university and my department. I doubt if I ever will be able to go back to that lab. The university took great efforts to prevent the spread of the news of the incident, and it looks like they did a good job. I think people should know for their own safety about that devilish lake, that abominable water body that cursed me for the rest of my miserable existence. While working at the university, some colleagues of mine and I came to know of this local lake, which allegedly had suddenly the clearest of all waters, all of a sudden, overnight. It didn't sound much at the beginning, but rumors and word of mouth started spreading quickly in the area with some incredible claims, like one that said you could see the bottom of the lake through the water as if looking through clear glass. This particular lake had been in the area all along, and there was nothing special about it. Locals often went fishing to this place, and teenagers used to hang around the lake perimeters having a good time with their lovers and friends. On one fateful morning, Pete and I decided to check it out ourselves, hoping that we would find something, and mostly because of our piqued interest in the lake after hearing about it almost every day for about a week now. We took our car and drove for a couple of miles before we reached the narrow, worn-down pathway that leads to the lake. It was an early morning, with the weather being crisp and the sunshine welcoming, and, lake or no lake, we were quite enjoying ourselves. We parked the car off the road and started to make our way through the narrow pathway. It was about a ten-minute or so hike till the periphery where the ground starts to slope and the waters begin. Being early morning, there were no other people or cars to be seen, and it was peaceful and quiet all around. While walking across the pathway, the evidence of recent human visitations were quite clear, with crushed Coke cans, empty bags of chips, and the like. 
A number of people have been here in the past few days to witness the clear waters firsthand and contributed to the folklore that was building up in the community regarding this place. We reached it, and what we saw really surprised us. The rumors were not entirely inaccurate after all. The water was clear, like crystal clear, and with the sun shining down on the lake, we could see to the bottom of it, right to the numerous pebbles and swirls of mud and silt on the lake bed. This was incredible. We were thinking as to what might have happened that suddenly made the water so clear and almost transparent as if it's just not there. Did the authorities clean it up or something? I've never seen such a cleanup job ever before, said Pete. Had it not been for the breeze which made the little waves on the surface, it was difficult to spot where the water began. A thought came to my mind. I told Pete about it and he agreed. It turns out I had some collection jars in my car, which, if I go back and fetch, we could take some samples of the lake water with us and test it in our lab, basically just to see if we could find out what made it so clean, so clear. A harmless activity, after all, since it's just plain old water. I noticed something quite odd in the lake, though. As we could see all the way to the lake bed, it was very stark to see that there were no fish in the water absolutely not a single one. Nor was there any plant life either. No algae, moss, or any of those long grass-like plants that grow underwater. It was as if someone had drained out the entire lake of all forms of life that it used to host. I told Pete about this and he remarked this was very unusual and that he noticed it as well. We knew that at the very least there had to be fish, as this lake was frequented by the local anglers. This odd observation made us even more determined to test the lake water, and thus I handed over an empty, sterile jar to Pete, and he crouched down and filled it up. Make sure you don't touch the water, I cautioned him. We hung around for another hour before heading back to the lab and also took some photographs of the lake. And yes, selfies too. Upon our return to the lab, Pete and I transferred the sample to a number of small beakers and kept them on a separate tray. The intriguing question at that point was why there was no life form to be seen. Was it because of any chemical spill? In that case, where were the carcasses of the fish and what happened to the plants? I discussed this with Pete over lunch and we decided to carry out a few basic tests. We did not have any fish specimen handy at that time, but we had tadpoles, which would do just as well. So, all being said, we started our little test. We took one of the beakers and set it up in a contained area, brought in one of the tadpoles and slowly dropped it into the beaker. The tadpole started moving about and thrashed its tail around. A minute passed and nothing changed. Pete and I exchanged glances. Then we noticed it the tadpole was changing color. The dark brown hue of its skin was changing to a lighter shade, and it started thrashing its tail furiously, as if struggling against some unseen force. Its skin color was now rapidly transforming to a clearer form, almost translucent, and we could see its tiny bones and organs inside. We were stupefied at this and had no explanation of what we were witnessing right in front of our eyes. The horror show had not yet ended, though. In a few minutes, the whole body of the tadpole became transparent and turned into a jelly-like consistency. The organs, bones, skin, eyes, everything had now turned transparent, and the creature stopped moving shortly before that. It was now still at the bottom of the beaker, and we could just faintly make out its outline in the now still water. Pete said, it sure looks dead, just the outline remains. Hand me the stirrer. I handed Pete the stirrer. He dipped the glass stirrer slowly in the water, and the end lightly touched the outlined shape of the dead tadpole. Doesn't feel solid, he said. Apply some more pressure, I said. Upon applying the slight extra pressure, the stirrer passed right through it and touched the beaker's bottom. The shape dissolved 
the almost transparent, silhouette-like shape of the tadpole simply dissolved in the water right before our eyes. We couldn't believe what just happened and simply had no explanation. We collectively let out a worried sigh and kept staring at the beaker. There were no visible changes in the water at all. The way it looked before we had dropped the tadpole and the way it looks now was exactly the same. It's as if nothing was ever done to the water, crystal clear, with nothing in it. Or so we thought. The procedure was repeated with another tadpole and a fresh beaker, resulting in the same outcome. We videotaped the process and planned on disclosing the find to our superiors. It made sense now as to why the lake water was so clear. There is definitely something in it that is responsible for these effects on living matter. Something that dissolved the fish, something that obliterated the tadpoles, something ungodly. With this in mind, out came the microscope. He prepared two glass slides, each with a drop of the cursed water, and set them up under the microscope. On closer inspection, with enhanced resolution, we saw a shitload of unicellular microbial organisms moving about in the slide sample. That single drop was teeming with creatures. It reminded us of the amoeba, a type of single-celled organism commonly found in water bodies. Maybe it was a much more aggressive subspecies of the same thing. The amoeba were moving in rapid, jerky movements, using their flagellum in a whip-like motion. What was very unusual was that, apart from the cell nucleus, there were no other cell organelles present, at least not with the current resolution of our microscope. We recorded all of these findings and compiled them to be presented to the other professors for their take on the matter. The species needed to be identified, and fast. I proceeded to transfer the beaker tray to a secure and dedicated biohazard area in the lab. I would never forget that fateful moment. The tray was in my hands and I was treading down the hallway with haste. I should have noticed the bunch of equipment cables snaking across the floor, but I didn't, and inevitably I tripped on it. The beaker closest to my left hand spilled some of the water on the tray and some on my clenched fist. I became terrified as the burning sensation started to gain hold, becoming intense with each second. I called out to Pete, almost screaming. Even in that moment of panic, I had to set the tray with the rest of the beakers safely on the floor and slid it under a table nearby, struggling not to lose my grip. Pete came running and didn't need to be told what had happened. He immediately grabbed a roll of tissues and approached me to wipe the stain. Gloves, Pete! Use your damn gloves! I screamed in panic, knowing what it would mean if the water came into contact with his skin. Peter realized it too and was fumbling to put them on and he threw the roll of tissues at me. My hand started to burn more intensely and no amount of wiping helped. I was losing feeling in the hand. The spot where the water made contact was now swelling and became deathly pale and blistered. It hurt like hell! I clutched my left arm with my right and held it. My left arm registered no sense of touch. I was able to move my fingers around till then, but now they were feeling stiff and immobile, almost paralyzed. Panicking, sweating, heart rate climbing, I was still trying to keep Pete informed about what the feeling was like. Then my hand started to dissolve, like those tadpoles and those fish. I was unable to move my fingers anymore, and I lost all sense of my left forearm. I touched a finger with my right hand and it was squishy and spongy. I couldn't feel the bone at all. The insides of all my fingers were being turned into liquid and as my skin lost its natural color and turning more and more transparent, I saw the insides of my fingers. No bones, no blood or blood vessels, no tissue, no nothing. Everything had turned into a clear liquid with seemingly nothing inside. This hideous transformation of turning my hand to jelly now started creeping up from the fingers upwards. I vigorously shook my hand, hoping to stop the ascent, and my fingers simply sloughed off from what remained of my palm. The pain was mind-numbing, and maybe it was enough to make one lose consciousness, but with so much adrenaline rushing through me, I felt every bit of the pain right to the bone. 
My sloughed off fingers and half of my palm lay on the floor, looking nothing like what they originally had been. It looked like a small puddle of water someone dropped from a cup while passing. So innocuous. The freaking amoeba were eating through to my wrist now, and I felt the sting and the pain with even greater ferocity. No amount of screaming helped. My throat started to hurt. Fellow researchers heard my screams and Pete's frantic cries for help and, oh my God, and rushed to our aid. Pete screamed at them to keep distance lest someone accidentally step on a puddle and end up just like me. Half of my forearm was now gone and the swelling mass of liquid just shed itself off and fell to the floor, creating another puddle. I threw a bunch of tissues over it to keep it contained. I then realized if I was unable to stop the amoeba from climbing up my arm, it would turn my entire body to jelly and I'd end up dead, being a puddle on the floor and that too very soon. Pete! The acid! Give me the acid! I yelled as loud as I could. Pete had his gloves on by then and quickly brought an unopened jar of concentrated sulfuric acid, prying it open on the way to me. Pete tore off a piece of the tarp covering equipment nearby and lay it down hastily. I lay down on the floor with my left arm stretched out and held with my right. In just a few moments, my elbow would start to dissolve. The thick, viscous acid emitted a vapor as the seal was broken, and Pete eagerly looked into my eyes for approval. I nodded. Sorry, man, he muttered, and started pouring the acid on the stump of my left arm. I saw my arm smoking, the skin turning black instantly as soon as the acid made contact. It was working. I was continuously screaming in sheer pain while Pete continued to pour the acid in order to kill the single-celled bastards. After he was done, the arm, or what remained of it, looked still and dead. There was no jelly transformation taking place anymore. The university authorities had been alerted by then and someone called 911. I wonder what the guy described to the operator. I could not take it anymore, and with the pain now greatly subsided, I passed out, unconscious on the floor. When I woke up, I found myself at the hospital with a huge bandage securing my once left hand. I felt dizzy and a throbbing sensation near my left shoulder. The doctor came in and informed me that they had to perform amputation from a little higher from the elbow and that there was no other option. The CDC had been alerted of the amoeba from the lake, and I later learned they had cordoned off and sealed all paths leading up to the lake, and armed guards were being placed to deter the curious public from the find. There was not much media coverage of the incident, and the only news report I saw just mentioned of an accident at the university. No details, no mention of the amoeba. My life has changed drastically since the incident. I have no more left hand, and I have a newfound fear and disgust of water. CDC is working closely with the university to identify the possible source of the organism. Was it some naturally occurring, previously thought extinct species that somehow resurfaced? Or was it bioengineered? Anyhow, that's all I have to say. Please shut the door on your way out. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The Cycle, an original story submitted by Michael Deeb at WeirdDarkness.com. Once a year, for about a month, the cycle repeats itself, and they change. 
they feed. Not out of hunger, but instinct. It's a curse handed down the generations through blood. Much like a drug addict, it creates an overwhelming need to feed the hunger no matter what. The beast they become is no longer man, no longer your friend or family. You would expect these stories to come from small towns, and this one is no different. Maybe that way they know they can survive. It doesn't make the major newsstands. It's just written off as some local psycho that they search for for a little while and give up. Or, since we're in the mountains, maybe it was a wild animal, maybe a rabid bear or a pack of dogs. I have lived here in Linglestown all my life, but have only had a handful of friends. Adam is a heavy set friend of mine from high school. Tim, he's a friend from the garage where we have both worked for the past 10 years since graduating from Linglestown High School. Then there is John and his older brother Jake. John has been a very loyal friend for the past few years ever since John, his brother Jake, and their mother moved here. The older brother, Jake on the other hand, was not much of a friend to anyone. He was a regular deadbeat in town. He couldn't hold down a job, always dirty, unapproachable. He had his run-ins with the law a time or two and was accused of some of the car break-ins that have recently been popping up. It's pretty bad, considering he's only lived here with his mother and brother for the past year. John's mom is a large woman, very worn-looking as well. You can tell that she's had a rough life, probably from all the years of raising Jake and trying to keep him out of trouble. John, on the other hand, is a clean-cut, very outgoing friend of the community. Without him, their family would probably be shunned in this town. Everybody liked John, and all of my friends were John's friends. Now, we've had our share of tales told in this town, like the White Lady of Buck Mountain, who was killed in her wedding dress on the mountain where she walks around looking for her lover, and a handful of UFO sightings. Even a local abduction that made the papers for a month, somebody's 15 minutes of fame. But this one was a little different. Bodies were found. In an old hunting cabin just north of town, two men from out of state were staying at a rented cabin for spring turkey season. One of the men's legs was found in the cabin and the other's upper torso was found on the roof. No other body parts have been accounted for yet. The community was eating this up. This was one of the most exciting things that have happened around here lately and it didn't hit home too much because nobody from town knew these two men. The rumors and stories were going through the roof. The one thing that fed fuel to the fire in this town was that last year, around the same time, a similar thing happened. Another couple of people, this time it was two teenagers hiking in the forest, the same section of woods where this year's two men were brutally massacred. They never found their bodies, but they did find their packs and shards of clothing in a nearby cave. A local hunter later that year shot and killed a bear that was accused of the death of the two teenagers. They found some of the contents of the kid's equipment in the bear's stomach, some packages of food, candy wrappers, small pieces of clothing, but no bones or any other evidence that it was truly the animal that killed these two. I never believed it. And now, how would they explain how a man's upper torso was found on the roof of their hunting cabin? The stories were fun for us as well. We loved the excitement of the whole thing. John and I hunted up there a couple times last year because he had a cabin he would rent up near there every year. Adam, Tim, John, and I would meet almost every weekend at the local diner and talk and plan out our yearly fishing and hunting trips. This time, we were talking about going to John's cabin and playing some cards, drinking beer, and waiting out the local creature with plenty of ammunition. Adam and I were very excited about the idea. We should definitely do that this weekend. I don't have to work, Adam said, very excited. Yeah, I'm okay with that idea. I can take my AR-15 and take this thing out, I said. What do you think, John? Well, I don't know. To tell you guys the truth, this thing kind of freaks me out, John said. What about you, Tim? I said, are you in? No, I can't this weekend. 
I can't stay out there. I have to be home Saturday night, Tim said. Why don't we just play some cards and drink some beer at one of our houses? That way I can just walk home that night and there won't be a problem with the old lady, Tim said. Somebody's being a pussy. Do you need your wife to hold your hand and walk you home too, Adam said. I promised her I wouldn't be out all night Saturday, that's all, said Tim, with his head hanging low. Anyway, why don't we just go to John's place then? He's got the pool table and the basement and everything, Adam said. Will your mom mind us being over? Or your brother? I said, knowing that we didn't want John's brother Jake ruining the party with his bad attitude towards everyone. You never feel safe around that guy. And John's mother wasn't the most sociable person either. Uh, yeah, I, I guess we can do that. No, that should be fine. Jake's working late that night. I'll just have to clear it with my mom, John said, ending up with a smile on his face with the thought of it all. No guns, though. We do live in town, you know, only at the hunting cabin. Besides, I know my mom won't approve of that, John says. You guys aren't worried about Jake, are you? You guys might be scared of him, but he doesn't worry me. I'm twice his weight. I'll break his skinny neck. Don't worry about him, Adam said sarcastically. Adam was one person in town that didn't claim to be afraid of John's older brother Jake. Any chance Adam got, he would test his luck against him, always trying to call his bluff. Friday rolled around, and everybody was excited to kick back and play some pool in John's basement. He did live right in town, but town was one stoplight and a few shops. His house was an old single brick home from the early 20s or 30s. It smelled musty, and John's mother never really kept up with the place. We all met up on the front porch. It was night already, and with all the stories of the creature around every crack and bump from the nearby woods, it gave me a small chill. I had an eerie feeling for some reason, but I think I always felt that way when I was around John's mom, and especially his brother Jake. John came to the door and let us in. The house was pitch black. I didn't see John's mother around. I was glad to tell you the truth. John said, Hey guys, what's up? Let's go downstairs before my mother wakes up. We all agreed and moved quickly to the basement. John's basement was a concrete floor with old block walls and big wooden beams on the ceiling. He had a pretty nice pool table, a radio, and a small fridge to keep our drinks cool. It was better than going down to the local pool hall and paying to play, and we'd stay out of trouble this way also. It wasn't much to look at, and occasionally when one of us would go upstairs to go to the bathroom, some dirt and debris would fall down from the ceiling. The floors were old, and at some places you could actually see through the cracks on the hardwood floors. An occasional spider would string down off the ceiling and land on Tim's hand and he'd freak out. It was lots of fun seeing him go nuts over a small spider. The night grew on, and around 11.30 we were shooting pool and talking about the creature. Adam talked about how he isn't afraid of such a thing because he has enough ammo to take down anything. Tim brought up a story he heard in town of an eyewitness account of the creature. Art at the gas station told me that he and his cousin saw this thing last Thursday here in town. It was just after they closed down the bar downtown. And just then, everybody yelled out in laughter, Come on, Tim! After we closed down the bar, of course he saw some kind of creature. It was his old lady! <laughs> Adam laughed loudly. No, no! Tim explained with a serious, wide-eyed look on his face. Arch said he went there to pick up his cousin, so he didn't get another DUI. He said after he picked him up, they drove through the alley down on 5th and Main and this huge dog-like creature jumped out in front of them and let out a horrible roar with blood-red eyes and a huge mouth. He said it had huge teeth and muscles like he'd never seen before. He said it must have weighed a ton. The roar caused the car to rattle. He slammed on the gas pedal and drove past it. Tim, that's like two blocks from here, I said, with a slight concern in my voice. John, you aren't worried. I'd be sleeping with my shotgun for sure. Maybe the creature will take care of John's dickhead brother for us, Adam said. Just then, we heard the front door slam open. 
we all jumped from the noise coming just after Tim's story of the beast. John looked at us with a pale look to his face and replied, Jake's home. We all listened in quiet, too, as we waited to see if we could hear him walking above. We all just hoped he would go immediately upstairs and go to sleep and not bother us in any way. I personally didn't want any altercation between Adam and him tonight. We heard a small dragging noise on the floor above near where the front door would be and then a loud boom. A short pause and then another boom. It was like a dinosaur walking slowly across the room above. With each step, a large amount of dirt and debris would fall down onto us from the decaying floor above. Boom! Boom! It was moving across the room. Everybody was still, not saying a word. The light bulb hanging by loose wires from the ceiling started to flicker with every thud. It seemed like it was heading towards the basement door, but the stairway for upstairs was in the same direction. Fear was running through my body. I started to think of what was available as a weapon down here in case we needed to make a stand. At this point, my mind was thinking in the lines that this was the creature we've been talking about and we're about to be its next victims. We weren't looking at the ceiling above anymore. We were now focusing on each other and the basement door. The noise stopped as we couldn't quite tell where the thing was anymore. I looked over at John He wasn't looking at the doorway, but more at the floor. He had an almost sick look to his face. John, I said, is that your brother? What is that? Just then, Adam spoke up, this time with a little stutter in his voice. You all are a bunch of uh, pussies. Adam was more than halfway lit already from the multiple beers he drank. That's it, Adam said. I'm going up there. Telling that motherfucker that he got dirt in my beer and I'm pissed off at his dumb ass and he better just chill the fuck out. Adam stood up and grabbed his pool cue and headed up the basement stairs. John suddenly yelled out at Adam in kind of a loud whisper Adam, get the fuck down here, leave it alone. You don't know what you're doing. Adam paid him no mind as he continued up the stairs. John chased up the basement stairs after him. Tim and I just looked at each other. I said to Tim, I guess this night's over with. The basement door slammed shut and we heard nothing but quiet. Then a sound almost like a scream but cut off short. Then a very loud thud and then a table or a chair fell over and the sound of breaking glass. The next noise sent chills down my spine. It was a deep hum or growl. Tim and I quickly looked at each other and with fear in our eyes, we both immediately looked back up at the basement door when we heard someone walking heavily up the stairs to the second floor, and just behind each step was a thud, thud, thud on each step, almost like something was being dragged up the stairs. I threw my pool cue down and moved quickly toward the basement stairs. I told him, I'm getting out of here. Whatever that was is upstairs now, and I'm leaving. I'm going to run straight out the front door. Tim looked terrified and was breathing heavily. I'm not going up there. I'm waiting for everyone else. They'll be back down. As he said that, we heard a dripping sound over by the pool table. We both turned to see what it was. It looked like blood, a steady stream of blood dripping down on the pool table from a crack in the floor above where we heard the crash of the glass and the short scream. I looked at Tim, nodding at him to come along. I turned and headed towards the top of the stairs. I twisted the doorknob and opened the basement door slowly. It was still pitch black out there, and I couldn't even see the front door to run towards it. The light from the basement was shining through the doorway where I was standing. Tim wasn't coming up. He was petrified with terror. So I closed the door quickly behind me, blocking the light from below to not let anyone or anything know that I was there. With my arms stretched out in the darkness, I started to feel my way towards the exit. I stopped briefly to try to let my eyes adjust and take a quick look around to see if I could see anyone, maybe the body of my friend Adam or John. As I looked around, I saw John's custom pool stick, 
leaning against the wall and another lying at the floor near the stairway that led to the second floor. It must have been Adams. Just then, I heard some voices. They were coming from the kitchen. All the rooms were as dark as night. I slowly moved towards the doorway between the hall where I was standing and to the kitchen to where the voices were coming from. As I listened closer, I could hear that it was John's mother talking, and she was talking to John. Mom, we can't do this anymore. I need to stop him, John said with a quiet and frantic voice. There's no stopping it. You know that you brought them here and you know what you have to do. John's mom said it with an evil, sinister voice. Mom, they're my friends, John said. You can't have friends. You know this. You need to be stronger. It's time for you to take care of your brother now. I'm too old and the next change will kill me for sure. My bones aren't strong enough, she said. I leaned forward to get a glimpse of them. I, I can't do this. They're my friends, John said, while appearing to bend over in pain. You have no choice. Your brother's cycle is ending and you know it is your turn now. John's mother said it as John fell to his knees in pain. She reached down to hold his shoulders. It's only 30 days, and you'll be back to your old self again. You know how you get every year you're like this. Then it will be my turn, my last. She let him go as he fell to the floor. John started to turn, his body contorted, and his face began to change. He was making a horrible sound, and just then I heard a loud growl from behind me. I turned saw by the stairwell a huge beast, one like described in the story that Tim told earlier. I yelled out in fear, all eyes gazed upon me, John's disfigured head glaring at me. His mom's eyes were glowing red in the darkened room, and from behind me charged the huge beast that was Jake. I ran as fast as I could, bursting through the front door. I jumped over the railing on the front porch and grabbed a neighbor's kid's mountain bike. I slammed the pedals down and flew through town. John, Jake, and their mother were never heard from or seen again. No trace of Adam was ever found by the police either. Tim left the basement shortly after I did that night once the noise subsided upstairs. He never saw anything, only the sounds of the creature. I don't know why they left Tim alone that night. Maybe they forgot about him, or maybe they decided their cover was blown and they needed to leave town. They may now be in another small town, feeding, and when the townspeople start spreading rumors of creatures roaming the night, stories will be real. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. A Scarecrow for God, written by Survival Procedure.
Can I take your picture? Larissa sat a few feet away from me on the gray velvet sofa as I aimed my iPhone towards her. I stared at the screen intently for a moment before shifting my focus, looking over the brim of my phone at her defeated, hopeless state portrayed by bloodshot eyes. What for? I don't think it'd be a very good one. She found it difficult to speak above a tone of depressing mumble. I'm not exactly prepared for a photo shoot right now. Stop it! You look beautiful. The chipper tone in my voice was a deceiving attempt to bring some semblance of elation to the bleak reality we had learned of our existence. It's not insecurity. You know that. Her looks were always something Larissa was confident in. That certainly wasn't the source of her discontent. Normally, we take pictures of happy times that we want to look back on and reminisce over, but neither of us were happy at that moment. Her face was a cemented lump of apathy that wouldn't be going away anytime soon. Why do you want a picture of me like this? Because I want to remember what you look like. She would be gone soon, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. I really can't say I blame her. Life had no purpose or meaning anymore. I was finding it difficult not to leave this world myself. The eye in the sky destroyed it all. Some said it was God. Technically, they're right, although the interpretation of God is a bit skewed and thus incorrect. They're just making excuses. I don't exactly blame them for their attempts to make sense of the eye. In a way, I sort of envy their ignorance. I wish I could live in bliss like that. Enlightenment is punishment. Larissa and I were co-workers at Caltech. I was head of the astronomy and physics department there, a position I held for the last eight years where I was lucky enough to fuel and satisfy my fascination with celestial objects for a living. Since I was a young boy, I looked at the sky in awe and dreamed of a weightless, floating journey through the stars. At night, I'd sit on my porch with my knees pulled against my chest and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in my hand, looking at the moonlight shining on trees and the sparkling fireworks hovering above the earth. A career in astronomy was all I ever wanted. Larissa came on board a little less than a year ago. For the past six months, we'd been something a little more than co-workers. Romantic interests, I guess? When you reach a certain age, you sort of stop putting labels on things. I suppose you could call her my girlfriend. Sounds so childish saying that at my age. Whatever you want to call it, Larissa had become another perk of my job. At 43 years old, I had never married. Never really had a serious relationship since my 20s. Routine, order, and the stars were all the gratification I needed. It wasn't until I saw Larissa that I realized how lonely my life had become. She was eight years younger than I and had the same thirst for the stars as I did. It was all we ever talked about, and with me being somewhat more experienced in the field, she clung to my every word, eating them up like she was putting sunshine in her veins. One night I invited her back to my quaint home in Simi Valley. We sat side by side on the grass next to the large oak tree in my backyard with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches pointing out our favorite constellations. She rested her head on my shoulder, and I knew I had found the person that I could share every part of my life with. I loved her, even though I couldn't bring myself to say it. Everything was right in the world. It all came together in harmonious delight when Larissa took over my heart. She filled a void I didn't know I had and quickly became my satellite, going wherever I went and running circles around me. All that changed two weeks ago when Keck Observatory contacted me for a consultation regarding an unusual discovery. The observatory, located at the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, was managed by Caltech and the California Association for Research and Astronomy. The site housed the two most renowned and scientifically productive telescopes in the world, capable of reaching the outermost areas of space. Each telescope 
sat mounted on Mauna Kea as two large spheres, 33 feet in diameter. Just after I'd come on board in 2008, the telescopes at Keck captured the first images of exoplanets within an exosolar system 129 light years away from Earth. The main star was named HR8799. The visuals took over a hundred years to reach our planet, and we took pictures of it like a group of excited tourists. What did you find? I asked Nora, the director of advancement at Keck, when she called. Her voice trembled on the other end. I don't know. It's I'm sending you a picture. You won't believe me if I told you. Sweetheart, just tell me. I heard a deep breath flow into the receiver. It's an eye. You mean the Helix Nebula? I asked, instantly reminded of the formation that looked eerily similar to an eyeball, resulting in the nickname the Eye of God. No, but similar, only much larger, and it's moving. Moving? Like orbiting around something? More like looking around at things. The pupil is moving. My face contorted from confusion. What? It didn't make any sense to me when I first heard it. Now, looking back, I wish I had just ignored that call and went about my life. But I suppose that's the nature of humanity, isn't it? We're all curious and desperate for answers. Nora sent me two pictures of what was observed through the telescope shortly after we hung up. The first picture appeared to show ionized gas surrounding an interstellar medium creating the illusion of an eye. It was unique although it was certainly nothing we've never seen before. But the second picture showed the medium moved slightly to the left, as though it were a pupil looking around and studying the universe. I wasted no time and booked myself and Larissa a flight to Hawaii. Part of my rush there was an anticipation of studying the odd formation and trying to determine why it was moving. Larissa could help decipher its origins. Plus, it was a nice excuse to take a trip to Hawaii together on company money. The next day, after we landed, Larissa and I drove up the access road in a car I rented up to the summit. At the top, we were just above the clouds. Mauna Kea is the highest point in all of Hawaii, and it's considered the best location in the world for massive telescopes like these. There's no obstruction blocking the view. I'd visited the site a few times since I took over the astronomy department. Each visit was breathtaking. Nora greeted us as we parked and led us through the observatory directly into the control room where a monitor was displaying the eye in the sky. In front of the monitor sat a couple of young men I'd never met before operating the controls. The pupil had moved further to the left since the last picture was taken. How much time passed between the two pictures you sent me? I asked Nora. Couple of days. It's moving very slowly. Possibly. Could also be moving incredibly fast. We're just observing a different gravitational time dilation through the telescope. How far away is this constellation? Nora took a deep breath and exhaled, maintaining her steady eyes fixed on mine. 45 billion light years. Huh? That's inconceivable. The farthest object ever recorded is Galaxy Max 0647 JD at 13.3 billion light years away, and that was with the Hubble telescope. Keck doesn't have that functionality. Well, it does now. We enhanced its mirrors two months ago to increase magnification capabilities. My eyebrows uncontrollably shot into the middle of my forehead. I don't recall hearing the board of directors approve such a thing. They didn't. This was a privately funded experiment, one that worked. Who funded this? Larissa chimed in. I'm sorry, that's classified information. I looked up at the thick metal beams and pipes of pressurized hydraulic fluids over our heads that held the massive telescope in place with indignant jealousy. The furthest reaching telescope ever created was partially owned by the company I held a relatively high position with. It was within my fingertips, yet I hadn't even the slightest knowledge of it. Optical instruments like this were invented to expand humanity's knowledge and answer some of the most complex and mysterious questions about the origins of everything in existence. 
and they were keeping the wonders of the universe a secret. So, basically, you have the most powerful scientific invention ever created by humanity here and didn't think it was necessary to tell anyone? It was an experiment. The funding was enough to cover the upgrade and reversion if it didn't work. Part of the agreement was secrecy. We only started using it last week. We wanted to be sure it worked before making any kind of announcement. This is not some rich kid's talk a truck, Nora. You should have gotten approval or at least mentioned it to someone. There's something I haven't told you about this eye, Nora continued, ignoring my discontent. We saw something else. My intrigue felt like a rush of adrenaline. What? One of the young men turned in his swivel chair and locked his wide eyes with me. God. I instantly rolled my eyes. Throughout history, when mankind has encountered something unexplainable, it's attributed to some sort of god or supernatural force only to be given a logical, scientific explanation many years later. Why would this be any different? We don't know that, Tim, Nora shot at him. What the hell is he talking about? Larissa questioned. I supported her demand. Indeed, what nonsense is this young man referring to? Nora resigned momentarily, then turned her head sideways to address Tim. Turn on the infrared. Tim flicked a switch on the control panel, and about thirty seconds later the outline of a face surrounded the eye. Shades of red and orange overlapped each other, clearly displaying a nose, a mouth, and a second eye that was covered by a winking eyelid. And just beyond the eye I could faintly make out more, smaller infrared outlines. My world had crumbled at the sight. One of my worst fears was a reality. Turn that monitor off right now, I ordered in a low growl. Tim sat motionless in his chairs, frozen in perplexity. Now! He jumped at my outburst and fumbled to find the switch. What's gotten into you? Nora demanded, squinting at me. Who else knows about this? The five of us in this room and ten other people. They all said it was God, too. Keep it that way. Tell no one. Tell that piggy bank of yours the modifications didn't work and revert the telescope back to its original state. Why? What is it? I looked at Nora with a stern eye. Humanity will tear itself apart over this. Is it God? Tim's hopeful expression was like that of a child. I couldn't take that away. Yes. It wasn't giant aliens, if that's what you're all thinking. An alien is a creature from outer space. These figures showing up on the infrared display weren't in outer space. They were beyond it. Nora and her team had built a telescope that had the capability of reaching the end of our universe. 45 billion light years. That's where everything ends. What's beyond that has been a complete mystery. Until now. It's something that I was frightened of when I first conceived the thought in 2004 after reading an article by Jim Holt proposing the idea of universe creation. Three years later, Lancaster University successfully created an entire universe in a test tube simulating the Big Bang with low-energy whirlpools of helium. The result was a functioning universe no larger than a marble. I had feared that our universe was created this way. And that day, in Keck Observatory, confirmed my fears. I saw our creators. Everything we've ever known to exist is all just a mediocre science experiment. At any minute, they could pull the plug on us and wipe it all away. We're all living at their will inside a test tube somewhere. We left Keck and returned to our hotel shortly after I pushed the telescope away from the eye and hoped it would never be found again. Larissa pestered me all night in our hotel room, doing all she could to force an explanation from me. I caved eventually telling her about Lancaster's test tube and how its origin is the same as ours. She wept the rest of the night. All we know, all we believe, everything is a lie.
the greatest lie ever told. I can't live in a world without meaning. She sat on my couch crying a few days after we returned from Hawaii. I don't want to wake up every day and think, is this it? Is today the day they end their experiment and kill us all? That's not a life I want to live. Don't let the stars die earlier than they're intended to, I urged. Let me show you the sky just one more time. Her bottom lip quivered as a tear ran down her cheek. Even though you're with me now, I'm light years away from you. That night, while I was asleep, Larissa snuck outside and tied a noose to a thick branch of the large oak tree in my backyard and hanged herself. Her side of the bed was empty and cold in the morning. When I extended my arm to her side and found it vacated, I already knew. She had taken her own life. Each night since, I sit on my back porch with her picture displayed on my phone, staring at both the stars and the shadows they create over my backyard. One shadow in particular dominates my focus. Deep down, I know it's unlikely the eye will see her, but personal conviction is a powerful prospect that shields truth. So I leave her there, oscillating in the wind, a dismal plea of desperation, the ominous scarecrow for our creators. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Satan's Fall, written by Robert Lyle. The Devil on the Fiery Porch. He was back again that year, the same as he had been for five years running, keeping the majority of trick or treaters behind an imaginary line of uneasiness drawn at the edge of the curb with his hell red grin and burning cauldrons. It was a scene from Faust, only this was no play. This was my neighborhood. It wasn't just kids who lingered apprehensively in the street, but parents as well. In a place where the definition of Halloween was more like cardboard skeletons and plastic jack-o'-lanterns, a guy with a penchant for fire and pitchforks could be extraordinarily scary. Really young children were hurried past the residents altogether via lawns on the opposite side of the street, hopefully distracted by candy long enough to save them from the psych-scarring nightmares certain to result from even the smallest glimpse of him. This left only the few, the brave, to make the journey and collect one of the candy bars given out by the devil basking in the red glow of the doorway. Trick-or-treating in the 1970s wasn't the flirt with death that it can be today. At that time, in most suburban settings, people lived in the same house for years and made the effort to get to know their neighbors and their neighbors' children. It was a safe haven from the malicious world beyond, a stronghold of sterile thoughts and selective ideals. That's why it was more alarming than the occasional anti-cleaver oddballs like the Warren family 
managed to infiltrate the peaceful utopia and upset the balance of neatly trimmed lawns and Tupperware parties. Especially when at Halloween their oldest son Wayne Warren painted himself red, donned horns, and sat on a throne between two flaming cauldrons on their sunken porch. My first encounter with him was when my father volunteered to secure one of Satan's fat candy bars on my behalf. I watched wide-eyed at the curb while my mother yacked up the neighborhood mothers about the sick nature of the affair. Later that night, as I spread my bounty out upon the living room floor, she snatched the king-size stickers that the devil had given and tossed it into the trash. Only later did I understand the action. Although, to my knowledge, no one had ever reported any ill effects from his confectionery treats. The grease paint devil quickly became a milestone of bravery for the youth of our neighborhood. As we got older, our worth was measured upon whether we had trick-or-treated his house on our own. For most of the neighborhood kids, it was a confrontation with their own childhood fears, a rite of passage. But my own eventual encounter with him reckoned with more than mere cultural demon speak. For me, it was not a conquest, but a beginning, a passageway to a haunted life well beyond the October ritual. And after what it indirectly wrought upon my life and the life of my childhood friend, Dan Rutgers, I came to realize that I had more in common with Wayne Warren than anyone would ever know. I was old enough to trick-or-treat on my own. I had been for a few years, having entered the seventh grade, but thus far had chosen to skip the devil's house despite my Samhain freedom. And as the candy collectors stood entwined in trepidation at the end of his lawn that night, I looked on, ready to cast away silly childhood fears. In the recessed front porch of the tan stone house, the devil sat on a black throne pitchfork in hand and grinning like a madman. On either side of him a cauldron belched hot flames which illuminated the entire alcove with a yellow-red glow that brought a little piece of hell right there to our suburban street. Dark music, probably borrowed from the Omen soundtrack, boomed from somewhere on the porch like a theme for a black mass. While sounds of the haunted house crept out of the home's dark windows, They were opened just enough to let in some of the autumn air which was uncharacteristically cool for Texas, even in late October. Every once in a while, the devil would bark out something to the effect of, come on up kids, or just let out a string of vein-chilling laughs that echoed off of the houses and faded into the night air like a horde of goblins. As a fan of the horror film classics, somewhere inside I had begun to admire his mastery of Halloween but the fear of something I did not fully understand still outweighed this association. The man behind the red face was something real, and that's what made him scary to me, even if some people simply wrote him off as a self-aggrandizing jerk. "'Are we going up there?' Dan asked me as I stood at the curb, siphoning the last bits of courage from my body. Dan was a few years older and several inches taller, but we were two boys made from the same mold. We had been best friends for six years now, both possessing a fever for Hot Wheels, Big Jims, and superheroes. I could see his own reservation just under the green skin of his Incredible Hulk face. His mother was an inferno-preaching Baptist, and though I could not understand it at the time, he grappled with issues far deeper than my own regarding the fiendish display. Yeah, I answered, although I had yet to top off my courage tank. Our mutual friend Bob spoke from behind his Planet of the Apes mask. Y'all can go if you want, but I ain't. My brother says that guy's a goon and you don't want to have to kick his butt when he finds a razor blade in my candy bar. I ain't going to eat the candy, I replied, stating what I thought was obvious. The music boomed forth with a new strain, and I looked hard at the real fire the past prime teenager in the red makeup and the iron gates which stood openly at the porch's arc. Well, you ain't gonna kill us or anything. He's been doing this ever since I can remember and lots of kids have gone up there. 
and nudged my head towards two other kids who had just been up to Satan. They just went, and if they did, then I'm going. Dan, you coming? Getting a yes from Dan, I put my foot onto the devil's brown lawn and began the approach. I tried to imagine what I saw across the street the other 364 days out of the year. A stony-looking house with a dark porch and some skinny, druggy guy coming and going in his beat-up Camaro. Sometimes kissing or beating his girlfriend a little, but always giving me a chin-up nod as if to say I was cool. It was just Wayne Warren, not the devil. Telling myself this made it a little better. But on Halloween, this guy was just plain different. Just plain scary. And as I neared, I tried the customary cool nod, but Wayne didn't nod back. Instead, he grinned like a mental patient and let out a laugh that resonated in the sunken porch as if it sunk all the way down to hell. Dan, in an attempt at proper All Hallows etiquette, moved up beside me, held out his bag, and muttered, Trick or treat, which sounded ridiculous under the circumstances. <laughs> Wayne cackled and threw a chunky bar into his bag. Then he focused on me and my spirit-gummed wolfman face. "'Something special for you, my friend,' he said, reaching down beside his seat. He pulled out something, gazed at it a moment, and then threw it into the sack I held open in front of me, as if it were my empty soul waiting for him to fill. I didn't get a good look at it, but I didn't care. I'd have a better look as soon as Dan and I got out of the yard. Without any more explanation, Wayne stoked one of the cauldron fires, spit, and turned his attention to a group of approaching teenagers. Dan and I hurried back to the curb where Bob waited. Let's go next door and check out whatever it was he gave me, I said. Squatting down under a street lamp, Dan and I pulled out our devil's booty. Just a regular candy bar, but Maybe there's a razor blade in it, he said, ripping into the package and breaking the chunky into several pieces, finding nothing but chocolate inside. Bob removed his Cornelius mask. What'd you get? I pulled out the weird item Wayne had thrown into my bag and held it up in the bath of white streetlight. It looks like a tooth or maybe a horn, I said, not having seen anything like it before. The thing was about three inches in length, jagged at one end and tapering into a curved point at the other. But instead of bone or enamel, it was made from a semi-transparent material with what looked like microscopic electronic components inside. Let me check it out, Dan said, grabbing it from me. That stuff in there looks like this computer board that my dad showed me. I took it back and looked again beyond its translucent surface. Computers are a lot bigger than this, I said authoritatively. Bob squinted at it. That's weird. I bet my brother knows what it is. Well, maybe we should ask him, I suggested. Bob's brother, Ronnie, rolled the horn thing between his fingers as he looked at it under the desk lamp. Looks like it came from a robot or something. Y'all are a bunch of goons tossed it back at me. Maybe it come from that alien that crashed over in Motor Valley, he added, making a spooky woo sound. Huh? All three of us replied. Ronnie laughed. <laughs> I guess you were all in diapers. A few years ago, the cops and everybody went out there when something crashed in the woods between Motor Valley Road and Screaming Bridge. Supposedly, they found a blown up flying saucer, but never found any aliens. When that idiot Wayne Warren was still going to school, I heard a rumor about how he and a friend of his were out there drinking one night and found some flying saucer parts. I think that was about the time he started dressing up like Satan on Halloween. Maybe he's giving out those UFO parts instead of candy. Cheap ass. I think it's all bullshit. With that, Ronnie left Bob's room. We all looked again at the thing. Pretty cool story, man. We ought to go out there and check it out. Maybe this did come from a spaceship, I suggested. Dan nodded. I ain't never seen anything like it. All the crazy, Bob said, looking suspiciously at us both. Anything good was usually off limits. 
It's the trade-off for having parents that give a shit about you. I wasn't allowed in the creek, not allowed to attend spin the bottle parties, not allowed in the yard of the kid who talked like a sailor with a belly full of gin, not allowed to ride my bike to Dairy Queen, and basically not allowed to venture beyond the small quadrant of my neighborhood. Motor Valley was definitely off my childhood map. As a result, I spent half my youth in the creek or making bike runs out of the quadrant and the other half making up plausible excuses for why I was late. So a trip to Motor Valley with my usual accomplice Dan was nothing too exceptional. But the possibility of dead alien creatures was, and that's why this mission was going to happen regardless of any potential consequences. Bob, however, couldn't go. He was grounded for getting caught with a pack of his dad's cigarettes. Looking back, I can't blame him for finding a way out. Motor Valley got its name from the motocross track that was built on the west end of its expanse. Except for a few ill-repaired roads that cut through it, the valley was mostly brushy Texas woods and low-lying flat land which collected water to create the closest thing to a bog central Texas could have. If something did crash in there, it was no wonder that collecting all the pieces was difficult. But since the time of the crash, which I later dated at September 30, 1972, by searching old newspapers, much of the water had been irrigated out to subsidize a local cattle feed farm, making it possible to get around in the area without sinking in muck. Dan and I biked down the road past the old junior high school and out across Highway 10 where a few industrial buildings and a bar called the Firehouse stood like holdouts against the concept of renovation. These were the last few constructs of civilization before Motor Valley took over. As we reached the end of the industrial stretch, we right-turned onto Motor Valley Road, which sloped down a gradual incline until it eventually curved south and cut right through the center of the valley itself. Few cars ever came this way, unless they were there to dump something or to take a shortcut to Highway 10, and Dan and I pedaled down the center of the curbless Macadam as if we owned it. Off to the side, either in the gullies or along the occasional dirt paths that spidered away from the road, we saw discarded relics of prosperity littering the land like pockmarks. Old washing machines, treadbare tires, skeletal couches and limbless dolls in their abandoned afterlife, serving as shelters for the dark, crawling creatures which hid underneath. We stopped pedaling to coast the hill. You remember the horn thing? Dan huffed. Yeah? You're going to be grounded forever if your mom finds out about this. I nodded dramatically. What'd you tell your mom we were doing? Going to Dairy Queen and the arcade? Hope your mom and my mom don't talk for some reason before we get back. You know how my mom's always calling to find out where I am. I told her I was just going to the arcade. She doesn't want me going over to the Dairy Queen. She heard a story on the news where this guy went into a Dairy Queen in Lubbock and whipped out his pecker and got thrown in jail. Dan laughed. Sounds like what Jimmy's cousin did at his birthday party. Didn't some girl kick him in the nads when he did it? Yeah, <laughs> he had to stay in bed for two weeks. Excellent. We made the curve and headed onto the long stretch of Motor Valley Road. After more than a half mile, we made it to the narrow side road, which led down to Screaming Bridge. I'm sure that wasn't its original name, but that was the name it went by. One of those tragic lover-suicide stories went along with it. We had heard plenty about it, but had yet to make the trip out. I guess it took potentially dead aliens to make it worthwhile. Turning left, we paddled up the side road, whose name was a mystery since it had no street sign. As we crunched along its crumbling blacktop, the trees began to grow thicker, leaning over the road to form a canopy. They cast a shadow across the road like a dark tunnel. Bony branches were beginning to emerge from the clusters of leaves which were falling away with each cool gust of autumn wind. For a moment, I thought of the forest in Oz, but such a pleasant thought quickly faded. I was positive that any beasts lurking in these thorn-ridden groves would not be singing or dancing. In fact, they were not even chirping or growling. It was oddly silent, which was even more disturbing. 
As we neared Screaming Bridge, the asphalt turned to sandy loam, making it difficult for our bicycles, despite the fact that they were rugged huffy models with plastic gas tanks screwed to the crossbar to emulate motorcycles. We decided to park them out of sight and go the rest of the way on foot. The bridge was nothing, really, a dirt road that ended in a huge drop filled with sun-faded beer cans and other less identifiable trash. After taking a piss off of its edge, we headed south in the direction Ronnie had told us the UFO had supposedly crashed. I checked my pocket for the lock blade knife I'd bought with my allowance prior to my last hunting trip with my father. I was no stranger to the country, having been brought along on numerous deer hunts since I was old enough to walk. But in spite of my self-proclaimed exploration expertise and my determination to expose the mystery locked away in Motor Valley, my heart beat hard against my ribs. There was something about the place that seemed deceptive, maybe even evil, which I had not encountered in any of my previous rural expeditions. Crisscrossing the area, we began to look for any signs of, well, whatever signs there might be of a flying saucer crash. But the undergrowth was thick, and I soon realized that there would be little hope of finding anything without knowledge of the exact impact location. We wandered on, though, scanning for burnt trees or any other peculiar markings. After about 30 minutes, Dan signaled me over to a dense clump of trees where he had spotted something. Check this out, he said, directing my vision past the branches to a dilapidated shack standing in a clearing 25 yards away. It wasn't a UFO, but at least it was something other than trees and rocks. Dan looked openly disturbed by the possibility of who or what might be making it a home. I wonder if anyone lives there. I don't see any cars, I remarked. I thought I saw something move by that window, Dan said solemnly. I looked at the filmy window. I don't know how you could have. Look how dirty it is. Yeah, maybe I was seeing things. I think we better get out of here. Search back over closer to the bridge. Let's not worry about it, I retorted, trying to look at the situation logically. If anybody does live there, they'll probably be really old and we can always outrun them. Dan nodded, but I could tell he wasn't wholeheartedly backing me on the decision. Let's go this... I began as I heard the sound of a stick crack behind us. I spun around. Just feet from us stood a man. He looked old, but his unkempt appearance made an accurate guess at his age impossible. His hair was a brownish gray and poked out from his head like wild grass, framing a dirty, unshaven face. A demented smile revealed several missing teeth from the brown, rotted mess inside his mouth. He was scratching himself through a convenient hole in his ratty overalls with a handful of long, curling nails as he leered at us. We started to bolt. Hold on, youngins! You boys can't just come poking around here without talking to old Licky! The man made a scrunching gesture with his face, which looked like the epileptic wink of a madman. We halted our retreat. I fished for something good to say. My dad's looking for some firewood right back there, I said, pointing in no particular direction. We were just looking around. You can't fool old Licky. I know you're out here by yourselves. If your dad was around, you wouldn't look so scared, he said this time fully protruding his tongue and circling it around his lips in a nervous motion. Really, sir? Dan began, but the old man cut him off. My feelings might get hurt if you keep lying, boy. We're sorry, but we have to get back home soon, I added, as if I were quoting from the repertoire of Wally Cleaver. Now, before you come on in, have a drink with Licky. I want to show you something. He began to walk towards us. Now, to this day, I can't tell you why we went into that weirdo's shack, but I guess we feared more what would happen if we didn't follow his wishes than what would happen if we did. Maybe I had more faith in my knife than I should have. Regardless, I kept my eyes on the old man as he led us into the leaning gray shanty. You boys like Coca-Cola's? He asked as we followed him inside. Uh, yeah, I said knowing full well that Dan was a strict 7-Up drinker, but under the circumstances figuring it wouldn't matter. The first thing that struck us sour about the inside of the shack was the smell. Worse than the smell of Licky himself, it was like 
the musty smell of an old house exponentially worsened until it reached near-organic putrefaction. A snail of nausea slinked across my gut as the first thick waft of stench rolled into my lungs. The cramped single room of the shanty was as rotted on the inside as it was on the outside. The exposed boards of the ceiling were completely gray and covered with cobwebs. An old rickety cot was shoved into one corner, a brownish stain covering its sagging middle. Over at the opposite end was a broken-down stove resembling a leper with its rust-eaten porcelain finish. The tattered beige couch sat rotting against the long wall, almost hidden by countless piles of old water-stained magazines. They looked mostly like playboys and hustlers, as far as I could tell. To our right sat a dusty old wooden crate. It looked to me like a coffin used back in the 1800s. A fat rat sniffed around its base. But the most shocking aspect of the shack was the wallpaper. Old pin-up style nudie pictures had been cut from countless magazines and stuck to every visible inch of wall. Superimposed on top of this layer were random pictures of goats and other wild beasts taken from magazines I wasn't familiar with. They were all faded by the damp and rotting conditions. I had seen plenty of naked pictures in my grandfather's garage, so I wasn't too shocked. But Dan's religious background didn't seem to be mixing well with a mass of nude women and goats. You boys wouldn't be looking for a UFO, would you? Licky asked as he began digging in a dirty box near the stove. I peeled my eye from a cherry nippled blonde. Why would you think that? I asked. I caught plenty of curious people digging around here like moles. They think they're going to find some kind of alien body. Why would they think that? I asked dumbly. A smart boy like you sure to know about the UFO crash over here, Licky said, pulling out two dusty bottles from the box. Why else you been out here nosing around? Well, we've heard about it, I guess, but I didn't know about alien bodies. These are good Coca-Colas, he said, popping the caps off the dirty Coke bottles with his teeth and handing one each to Dan and I as he made another 360 around his chops with his tongue. I discreetly knocked a dirt dauber's nest off the side of my bottle and took a drink. Actually, I let the liquid touch my lips, making it appear that I had taken a drink, not letting any of it slip into my mouth. Dan did the same. How do you like old Licky's place? You always got names? Uh, Jim, I said, making one up. Dan delivered one too. And Horace? Under any other circumstances, I would have busted out laughing, but the unsettling atmosphere suppressed any such reactions. I used to have a granddaddy named Horace. Loved him to death, that old bugger. Silly as a whistle, though cut his own arm off one night thinking it was a rattler. The old man laughed loudly and moved his arm around like it was a snake. I glanced back at the door. I felt better knowing that we stood closer to the door than Licky. I noticed Dan still staring queasily at the exotic wallpaper with a clash of curiosity and horror as if he were looking at a car wreck. Did you see the UFO crash? I asked, trying to conceal my nervousness. Well, not exactly. I come here after that. You're looking for the UFO too? Nah, them rangers hauled that off. I'm, I was waiting for something, a, a horn. With that, my heart went flatline. The thing in my pocket was in some way connected to the old man. I began to realize that maybe what Wayne Warren had said about finding some flying saucer parts may have been true. You ain't happen to see a horn out there, have you? he said, moving to the wooden crate. Was it a real UFO from outer space? Dan finally kicked in. Yep, from a planet so far away that them stupid scientists ain't seen it yet. Hey, you never answered about that horn. His twang suddenly growing menacing. Our faces began to flush. You and a clever dickens know something, don't you? He ran his hand across the crate like he was caressing the skin of a lover. What horn? Fess up, boy! If you got the horn, you can't resist it. I knows because I found the other one when I was working for the sheriff's office and we was out here cleaning up after the crash. I found something else, too, that the rest of them never saw. Fear finally slapped my common sense. I pulled the clear horn thing out of my pocket. 
I, I got this trick-or-treating, I said as I threw it to the floor behind Licky and bolted for the door. Dan turned to follow, but a deep bark stopped us midway. A large dog stood growling outside. We looked back at Licky, fully expecting him to move in for the kill right then. Colossus, simmer down, he yelled gruffly. He's just a tad grumpy, if you know what I mean. You, you don't got to be scared of him or old Licky. I, I like you boys, he said, picking up the horn. What do you want from us? I demanded. Nah, yeah, don't get all upset. You brought me this here horn that I've been looking for. Does that have something to do with the UFO? I asked, trying to calm down. Where'd you get it? From some guy dressed up like the devil on Halloween. <laughs> I knew it, he said with a lick. I knew he'd find his way back here one way or another. Dressed like the devil. <laughs> God damn. He seemed excited by the fact that Wayne had been dressed like Satan. I wasn't sure what the connection was between him and this old man, or if there even was one, but somehow we had been transporting something very important. Does that belong to an alien? Dan asked. Some folks might call him an alien, he began, but it really belongs to the devil. I've been keeping his body here since his spacecraft wrecked waiting for his other horn to turn up. Sometimes it takes a dickens for things to work out, but they'll always do. Now I, I get the rewards I deserve. The devil? I asked skeptically. Licky patted the wooden crate. Yes, sir. He's in here. We were speechless. I bet you boys would like to see him, wouldn't you? I shook my head slowly as tears began to well in my eyes. Dan just stood frozen as if he were looking down upon Virgil's nine rings of hell. Well, here he is! Licky yelled as he flung open the crate's lid. Its old hinges screeched like a dying animal. Inside lay the body of a creature. It was a brownish red and shriveled like the corpse of a mummy. It had arms and legs and a human-shaped torso, but they were thin and wiry. Its pointed chin and bulbous forehead made it appear like a reddish version of the little gray aliens that people always claim to see. A set of pointed teeth were thrust forward from the retracted lips, opposing the huge sunken sockets in whose valleys rested closed eyes. I could smell the acrid odor of age filling the room as if the beast were centuries old, having soaked up the stench of death and decay for an eternity. We were repulsed, though neither Dan nor I could take our eyes from the entombed thing. Just like in the storybooks, except he don't come from no hell. He's from up there, Licky said, pointing to the sky. Been coming here longer than you and I can figure, he exclaimed. Don't you like him? That's when I noticed the horn. The creature had one horn identical to the one that I'd been given. A jagged hole at the other side of his head made it apparent that he had once possessed two. <laughs> at last, I can raise him again. I'll be made of prince of the sky when he sees what old Licky's done for him, the old man said, drooling a line of spit onto the creature's chest as he began to fit the missing horn back in place. The dog outside barked, and we remained trapped between two rapidly off-balancing evils. Licky laughed as the component finally clicked into place. A faint whir became audible from the coffin as he pulled back. We're close, boys! You brought back old Nick! The thing began to move, not mechanically like a robot as I would have thought, but more like an organic being that had been sleeping for a long time. It sat upright as the eyes began to open. Their dark menace looked like black mirrors as they focused on our white faces. Its skin became more supple and its lips rolled back down over his teeth. The thing smiled a grin that was beyond pure evil that seemed to crawl through my eyes, down my throat, and squeeze the bloody pulp of my heart like a constrictor. But I resisted, and so did Dan. Breaking our gaze, we ran for the door as the beast jumped from the crate. I had been used somehow to bring the horn back to the creature. It seemed to explain my complete lack of good judgment when we followed Licky into the shack. I had been possessed by something much the way Wayne Warren had been, dressed up like the devil, probably unknowingly waiting for some adventurous kid to take the horn from him like the wind carries a seed to its final destination. 
where it could root and produce seed of its own. Hate you, Butte! Licky cried. The devil responded with a snap of his clawed hand. Blood splattered the nude-papered wall as the old man chortled and fell to the ground, callously beheaded despite his service. Shit! I screamed as Dan and I burst through the door and tripped over the dog. We both hit the ground along with the dog in a whirlwind of confusion and gnashing teeth. I felt a few bites hit my arms, but when the devil crashed through the door, the dog yelped and darted into the trees. The creature smiled again and looked at us. It was one of those split seconds between reactions when the mind and body are trying to get into sync, when the true perspective of time is lost. For a few endless seconds, the foul beast stood above us, and before we could pull ourselves up to run, he turned and headed into the woods. He spun his neck around to look at us one more time as he blended into the countryside and disappeared. Dan and I ran in the opposite direction back toward our bikes. We said nothing as we careened through the branches and undergrowth gouging at us with fingery thorns as if it were reluctant to let us leave. It wasn't until we had pedaled all the way back to Motor Valley Road that I finally broke the silence and confronted the reality of what had taken place. Do you think it was the devil? Dan, terror etched into his face, shook his head. If it was an alien and there's more of them... He began to cry. I could feel my hands trembling on the handle grips. The reality of aliens and devils or something that was both was too much for my young mind. We can't tell anyone, I said. I don't ever want to talk about it again. We won't. Never, was the last clear word I heard before he fell into a repetitive mumble. If it was the devil, alien or otherwise, and we were responsible for bringing him to life. I grappled with the thought, the thought that has slowly wrested the life from me over the years like a patient serpent subduing its prey. The same thought that was responsible for the phone call I just received. I gently sat the telephone receiver back into the cradle. It had been Dan's sister on the line. He was found dead in his car that morning. He'd been missing for weeks. She asked me if I had any idea why he would have driven out to a remote spot in Motor Valley and put a gun to his head. I told her I didn't know. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.